Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. And only because of God's grace through the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have not found it necessary to, nor have I taken a drink of an alcoholic nature since April the 20th, 1967, and for this I am so thankful. <laughs> and first of all, I want to thank your committee for inviting both Grace and myself to be here this weekend and allow this alcoholic to the freedom to share this alcoholic with you and the freedom for you to share yourselves with this alcoholic. And I want to thank Bill for picking us up there in, in Omaha and bringing us here. And one of the reasons that van didn't turn over to that big wind that was blowing outside because there was so much wind on the inside of the van, it just sort of leveled it off. <laughs> the only, the only thing I know about being an alcoholic is how I drank alcohol and a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I say that, and I admit that to you or to anybody, any place, anywhere, that means that I fit every word, every comma, every line, every period, every paragraph, every page within the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know no other way to live sober. And since April the 20th of 1967, I have not found any reason whatever to leave Alcoholics Anonymous to find an easier way to live sober, a more sociably acceptable way to live sober, a more fun way to live sober, nor a more exciting way to live sober. Thank God I haven't had to go to one of those action-reaction courses, concentration movement, related disorders institute. When I got to you people, my wife was a related disorder. <laughs> Hang in there till your drawers fall off, baby. Sexual dysfunction seminars. Well, I'll tell you, if you get as old as I am and been able to stay sober only by the grace as long as I've been able to, today I do not need a sexual dysfunction seminar. <laughs> I need a memory course. <laughs> now, we hear a lot of things in Alcoholics Anonymous today. You know, I'm an adult child of an alcoholic, dog, cat, snake, kangaroo, gorilla, minor bird, zebra, gorilla. I'll let you know right up front, I'm an adult spouse of an al <laughs> As was read a while ago that our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, what we're like now. No, I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I was born with a gold spoon in my mouth. I was born into a family that there was nothing in this world that I couldn't ever have in life. All the money, all the education, all the love and understanding. And I had a mother and father who dedicated their lives to give to the two sons that were born of that marriage, and I being the oldest, everything that was denied them when they were growing up. And if one of the sons is going to become an alcoholic, I do not know of a better deal when you've got a mother and father that's willing to go to every and any length to keep you from hurting and to keep you from suffering and to keep you from facing the consequences of one's act and not to bring shame and disgrace on the family name, the family heritage, the family religion, the family business, and everything about it. Alcohol has always been in our home. It was always on the dining room table, on the sideboards in the cabinets. My father would come home every night from his business and he'd sit down and he'd pour exactly one ounce of whiskey. Put the cap back on the bottle, take one ounce, drink water, and he said, let's eat, Mama. And as little kids, we were allowed to taste it. We were ingrained very, very thoroughly that drunkenness was a sin. Drunkenness was for bums. If alcohol was good for the appetite, if used in moderation, with common sense. My mother did not drink alcohol. But when I tasted that alcohol, I don't know. I wasn't like my daddy. I wasn't like my mother. I wasn't like my brother. And I tasted it and I liked it. 
And every chance I'd get, I'd sneak in and I'd find some of Daddy's whiskey that he may have forgotten, you know, give away as a gift to someone, and I'd drink it. And as a result, when I was nine and a half years of age, nine years of age, rather, I disobeyed my mother. And I was injured. And at that time, I was injured, and I contacted a very, very serious, in those days, bone ailment called osteomyelitis. And that was before the modern chemotherapy. It was even before the sulfur drug. And it was a hellacious thing. And I was put in the hospital, and I was told that I was going to lose my right leg. Because I lied to my mother what really happened. And I found as long as I could lie to my mother or anybody else early in life and they believed it, I didn't have a lie. Everything going to be all right. And the surgeon wanted to cut my right leg off and my mother looked at him and she said, you will not remove my boy's right leg and he didn't do it. But I laid in that hospital, I was in a Catholic hospital, all them nuns running around looking like little penguins. And I was the only child on the orthopedic ward and I found out, when, it didn't take me long in that hospital to find out that all those elixirs that they gave you for pain all had alcohol in it. And I'd drink it and I'd scream out, I'm hollering, and they didn't want little David to holler. And so they'd come in with another glass of that juice. And I left that hospital on crutches and I was condemned to be a cripple the rest of my life. And since I couldn't run and play baseball and football and all the games that the youngsters were playing, my mother and father decided that I was going to be a concert pianist. And I didn't want to be a concert pianist. And my daddy bought the first baby grand piano that South Dallas had ever seen. And people used to drive around for miles to look at that thing. And there they had me parked up there and playing those scales and everything else. And I didn't want to be out there. And I'd drink daddy's juice. And I'd say, dreamed that I was a cowboy, that I was a football player, that I was a wrestler, that I was everything in this God's world. And I looked at that leg, and that leg didn't look bad to me. And I had a boyfriend whose father had a business on Skid Row. And Jack said to me one day, you are so miserable. Here it is, school's out, why don't you come down, we'll park you on an apple crate, and you can count the trucks as they're being loaded and unloaded. Come on down. And I went down. And that was the first of the three skid rows that I was to live on in my lifetime. One for over six years, one for over four years, but the last one for 14 months was the toughest. And I went down there as a youngster, ten and a half years of age, and I fell in with there were 11 blacks in me, and I started drinking bay rum and wine. And that was on a daily basis, and that was a standard fare. And later on, as I grew older physically and get more money in my pocket, I could go from that bay rum and that wine to that good stuff and never miss a lick and come back down from that good stuff down to Gypsy Rose and Thunderbird and never miss a lick. Because I don't know about anybody in here. I was not drinking it because it was socially acceptable. I was not drinking it because it made you better this or worse this. I was drinking it because I liked what it did to me and with me and for me when it got in and down and through me. And I like what it allowed me to do to you or against you when it got in and down and through me. And little did I realize that the first drink of alcohol I took, it affected my head that said, David, every chance you're going to get, you're going to take a drink of alcohol to reproduce that initial effect. And I did not know it right there and then it was the beginning of a problem. And when I started drinking that bay rum and wine, I wasn't there two days. I threw them crutches away, and I haven't been on crutches ever since. I learned a lot of things down on Skid Row. Never get your back up against a wall, didn't have a back door or window you could jump out of. Come in mighty handy later on in motels and hotels, I'll tell you. If you smoke or eat anything, keep both hands free so you can hit and run. And if you drank that wine like that, that wine will hang you without a rope. And I've always been five foot six. I was born five foot six. <laughs> and I drank that juice and I'd be seven foot tall. I've had hundreds of fights. Never one of one. My nose has been where my navel is. My navel's been where my right ears. I've been all rearranged. 
when I was 14, 15, 16, 17 years of age, to run off and join Ringling Brothers and Martin Bailey Circus. Back in those days, the Ringling Show was the finest and largest on the canvas in the entire world. It would have been a thrill for a youngster to go in those days with the circus with all the wild animals and all the clowns and all the aerialists. And, and back in those days, the, the head man on the Wild West Show was Tom Mix and his trick horse, Tony. And I was with him when Gargantua the Gorilla come aboard. And I'll tell you, and I, and I admired Gargantua. He's the only one that had an air-conditioned cage. <laughs> and I drank that juice, and thank God I had I sent it enough not to crawl in there with, with Gargantua. But I got my cage later on, and it wasn't air-conditioned. I don't mind telling you. And, you know, I learned a lot of things in the circus. But one thing, I, I, I had the finest drink in the circus, and you drink everything in the circus. And I went because you could fight and drink, let's face it. And I didn't like discipline. But you see what I didn't tell you? When I got down on Skid Row and I started drinking that Bay Rum and Rhine, right there and then, my perspective in life changed. No longer was I interested in 14th century history. No longer was I is interested whether Washington crossed the Delaware or he swam the Delaware. No longer was I interested in the values of which my mother and father were so devout in. And then when I went with a circus and start drinking all that good stuff, my perspective in life changed again. Because when I started on Skid Row right there and then in life, I wanted to be a bum. Because here I am just a kid down with all these elders down there you didn't have to bathe every day. You didn't have to change clothes. You didn't have to listen to them on Saturday night when you took a bath. Be sure and splash cold water on your chest so you won't catch a cold. You know, I went with a circus. My value changed again. I not only wanted to be a bum, I wanted to be a nomad to travel all over the world and to be tattooed from the top of my ears down to my toes. And I learned the most beautiful concoction to drink in the circus that's ever been devised by a man called Green Lizard Circus Style, a tremendous drink. Elixir of sodium bromide, lucky tiger hair tonic. <laughs> and I used to drink that stuff, and I've seen Bambi and those animals in Technicolor long before Walt Disney had put them on screen. <laughs> but I'm trying to live three codes of living, and it's tough for a drunk. I'm trying to live the code of living that society was demanding that I live, and that's to go to school and become a useful human being and be of service to my God, my family, and my countrymen, and not end up in goony roofs and in jails and sleeping in alleys and in bushes and in drain pipes and cardboard boxes and over steam grates. I'm trying to live the code of living my mother and father wanted me to live, and they had all the money. And if you had already been all the trouble I had been in, was in, and getting ready to get into, it takes a lot of money to get you out so you can get back in it again. And then I'm trying to live the code of living that says alcohol was demanding on my life, and you're way ahead of me. You know which one went out. My mother and father would find me. they drag me back to school. I didn't want to be in school. I'm still working down on Skid Row and living most of the time down there. And by hook or crick, I graduated and went on into professional school. Still living down on Skid Row, going to school. At the end of my first year in professional school, I flunked out of school. For no other reason except because of my alcoholism, which I did not know at that time that's what it was. And I had to go home and tell my mama. And my mother said, what happened? And I said, the professors don't like me, they don't like our kind, and they don't like our kind with our kind of religion. And she said, they cannot do that to my boy. And I knew right there in the end, two days later, I was going to be back in school. And she turned to my daddy and she said, Papa, you get my boy back in school. And two days later, I was back in school. And, but I'm still drinking with that promise that it's going to be better. And I met this wonderful gal, Grace. And we decided we're going to get married. But I told her, I said, we're going to get married on some conditions. She says, what's that? I said, well, if we get married, your parents will have to pay half the living expenses. 
My parents would have to pay half the living expenses, and you'll have to work, and I'll go to school. And we were married under those conditions, and that's ideal for a blooming alcoholic. You don't have to do nothing. <laughs> and so finally we graduated by hook and crook, and then the United States Navy made a tremendous mistake. They declared me an officer and a gentleman. And I sallied forth in the service the first time with grace. Oh, it wasn't too bad. Oh, I missed ship a couple of times. Fell off the fantail of one of them. You have not lived until you have been drunk and you have fallen off the fantail of a battleship and it is in dry dock. <laughs> they look at you strange. We got out of the Navy, come back to Dallas, and I started dental practice, started making more money than I ever made in my life. I put that money in my right hand pocket, steal it with my left hand, stay drunk. And on the last Wednesday of August of 1950, which this year will be 41 years ago, I stumbled into one of Dallas's more affluent barber shops, and I fell in this chair at this manicurist table. Now, I was more at myself that morning. Now, being more at myself in those days meant that I was drinking. I wasn't too drunk. I could sit in a chair for about ten minutes without falling out of it. <laughs> I could navigate to and from the men's room and go out and get me a bottle of whiskey. This guy looked at me and she said, David, and right there and then I should have known something wrong. She didn't call me doctor. She said, David, I belong to a deal called Alcoholics Anonymous, and I have not had a drink of alcohol in a year. And I looked at Edith and I said, you are a liar. Nobody stays sober a year, a day, two days, but not more than three days. No, you're a big liar. She says, no, David, I haven't had a drink in a year. Now, Edith looked like a drunk ought to look like. Sort of a female-looking Bill Benedict over here, you know. <laughs> Her face wasn't real pretty. It looked like a truck had run over it and then backed over to see if it done a good job. She had big bug eyes and gaps in her teeth, and God bless her, her nose had been broken so many times drunk, just sort of leaned on the left side of her face. <laughs> now, this is back in the days before the gals used to wear pantyhose, they used to wear garter belts. That's to pull their drawers down and hold their socks up. <laughs> and when she was drinking, hers always trailed behind her uniform. She'd trip and fall and drop all them manicure and bottle, you know. But when that old gal told me, and the best way I can describe Edith's looks is a drunk. And some of y'all had this unfortunate experience the last couple of days. But in our part of the country and up here, if your car is caught out in a hailstorm and it's pretty badly beaten up, right when you get your insurance check, if you have insurance, some wise buzzard says, I don't get it fixed. Let it sit out in the hot sun for about three or four weeks and all the debts will pop back out. Her dents never pop back out. <laughs> but God, she's a great gal. But when that tough cookie told me she hadn't had a drink of alcohol in a year, that got my attention. Because Edith had the reputation when she was drinking. She was an incorrigible, mean, nasty, fighting woman drunk. She was a pint drinker. She carried a big black purse and always had two pints of whiskey in that purse. And she would kill you if you got in that purse. And here she was. And that got my attention. So I noticed she changed. I got to watching her that morning. I noticed when she was giving me my manicure that she was buffing my nails instead of my knuckles and my elbows and my ears like she used to. I looked up at her face. Her lipstick was on her lips and not her eyebrows. And I sniffed her and she didn't smell halfway between an Avon woman and a whiskey bottle. But more important, she did not grab her purse and say, Now, I'll be back in ten minutes and maybe show up eleven months later. But I noticed the real change, and the change was in her eyes. In Alcoholics Anonymous, we have two kinds of eyes. We have those sad, sick eyes. And then we have those happy, dancing, laughing, sparkling, living, sober eyes. Oh, we got another kind of eyes, those glassy eyes. Oh, they'll get up behind one of these things and say, Well... I am had a drink of alcohol, you know, and then fall over. <laughs> but her eyes were sparkling and they were jumping and she looked like she was having a lot of fun living sober. 
Then she turned to another manicurist in the shop by the name of Moena, and she says, Moena here is my sponsor. And she had 15 months sober in this deal called Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, in those days in Alcoholics Anonymous, and when I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, when we mentioned or talked about our sponsors, it was with reverence. Because we respected them. We literally turned our lives over to their care as a result of their experience. And you might as well know it right now. In Alcoholics Anonymous, we're asked to share our experiences and not our opinions. Because we find as a result of our experiences in Alcoholics Anonymous that opinions in many, many instances have a tendency to make sick people sicker. And in some instances to physically kill people. We have no right to monkey with anybody's head. No right to monkey with their marital life or their unmarital life. No right to monkey with their sex life or no sex life. All we have to share is what it used to be like, what happened, what it is in our own lives. The freedom to be ourselves. I almost died trying to be like my daddy, my mama, my brother, my neighbor. I come to Alcoholics Anonymous and say, just be your stinking selves with all your defects of character. And that's a freedom that we can't handle. It's too good to be true. But I had many, many years to go before I used to realize this. I certainly did. Now, I drank a lot of more whiskey with Moena, far more than I did with Edith. And I looked at Moena and I said, you're a bigger liar than Goofy over here. I said, we ha- Moena, we had a drink. She says, no, David, I have not had a drink of alcohol with you or anyone else or myself in 15 continuous months. Edith has not had a drink of alcohol in 12 continuous months. Little did I realize that those precious words that that lady said to me that morning would stick with me for many, many, many years. Thank God she didn't say she belonged to deal where you get sober and you go out and get drunk, come in and get sober, go out and get drunk, come in and get sober, go out and get drunk, come in and get sober. She talked about continuous sobriety. At that time, I did not know it was one day at a time. And then she said to me, David, this Sunday, We have an open meeting at 5.30 in the afternoon. And it's open so the public can come and hear and see how an alcoholic recovers in the AA Recovery Program and how an alcoholic lives the AA way of life and also to find out for the non-alcoholic what AA is and what AA is not. And believe it or not, the greatest challenge that we have within Alcoholics Anonymous right this second all over this wide world that there are hundreds of thousands of our members who do not know what Alcoholics Anonymous is not. That we're not all things for all people. The singleness of purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous has made Alcoholics Anonymous what it is. The envy of every self-help, peer, fellowship, whatever you want to call it in the world. But they are not willing to go through the pains and the frustrations that was read as a result of the traditions. Because the traditions are not the result of our good behavior, they are the result of our bad behavior. Now we hear there how it works, the traditions is why they work. And consequently as a result of it, they don't want to join, they want flood us with all of their problems and all of their things. But you see, it's a singleness of purpose, as was read a while ago, our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. Now, members of Alcoholics Anonymous were or will always be alcoholics, even though we may have other addictions. And that umbrella covers every doggone bit of it. And I did not know all this. And then she said, and then she said, although we do not give any awards or medals or honors for our sobriety, being that it is the last Sunday of the month, it is a tradition of their AA group that they have a sort of little group anniversary party. It's not a regular A meeting, she said, for those who have one or more years of continuous sobriety. And I thought that the only reason that people such as you would invite someone such as me to come to one of your AA meetings and stay to one of your AA functions is that you needed to have some good-looking, outstanding, and successful professional man come and upgrade you bunch of lepers in the community. And I'd glad to come help you. So I went home and told Grace, Grace said, God, Grace was thrilled because people had long since quit asking us to come around. 
Grace used to ask me why they were not asked to the outdoor barbecues, square dances, round dances, nightclub suppers, swimming pool parties, pin the tail on the donkey, whatever drunks do on Saturday night. I said, it's you. It's you. <laughs> I said, every time we're asked to go out on Saturday night, you start on me on the Monday before. You start screaming. You're not going to drink. You're not going to get drunk, are you? And you wake me up out of a sound sleep the next morning at 5.30 screaming, did you hear what I said? And you keep it up Tuesday, Tuesday night, Wednesday, Wednesday night, Thursday, Thursday night, Friday, Friday night. And what a tremendous price society's had to pay, is pay, I guess will always pay. Those who love us, those who hate us, those who do not even care that we exist on this earth. What a tremendous price those people are paying to find out that the more you scream at our kind about our drinking, the more we're going to drink. I said, and furthermore, when we get to where we're supposed to get to, before I can even park the car, you're out of the car, you run in, you grab the host, the hostess, you chase them out of the den, through the kitchen, in the backyard, in the alley, in the bushes, in the garbage, in the neighborhood, screaming, don't you give him a drink. <laughs> Woman, you're sick, that's what's wrong with you. <laughs> but through tear-filled eyes, she said, we're going to meeting, and I said, yes. And so that Sunday morning, I got up at 5.30 in the morning to get ready to go to an AA meeting 5.30 that afternoon. Well, now, what does a good self-respectful drinking drunk do when he gets up 5.30 on Sunday morning? Drinks alcohol, that's what he does. Let's face it, it's very simple. Golfers golf, fishmen fish, drunks drink. There's no big mess. <laughs> And I started sucking on a brand new bottle of whiskey. You know how it is? You take that first drink, God, that gets your breathing started. Then that second drink regulates your breathing. Then that third drink goes down to both heels and just sets you there. Now you're ready to do some real drinking, aren't you? <laughs> and I'm drinking and I'm looking up at the birds and the bees and the trees and I'm hearing the neighbors screaming, Johnny, get dressed. We'll be late for church. And I said, oh, those sick people. They don't know what living really is. If they could just learn how to control it and enjoy it, like I was doing, that they would find out that right after breathing in and out, alcohol is the second greatest gift that God's given mankind. Amen. Took another drink. <laughs> Drank half of that fifth of whiskey, put the other half to fifth trunk of my car because I knew at that time that I was going to be required to have another drink of alcohol, not knowing whether it's going to be half an hour, hour, two hours, three hours. And I'm one of these that firmly believes that if and when an alcoholic comes to us, that until that alcoholic is willing to find out what's wrong with that alcoholic, that alcoholic will never be able to find out what can get right with that alcoholic. And I went in and I bathed and I shaved and I put on everything rich and nice looking to impress those poor, sick people in Alcoholics Anonymous. Put on a beautiful, brand new, tailor-made suit. White on white monogram shirt, monogram handkerchief, monogram tie, monogram drawers. Put on my diamond ring, my diamond watch, and the trademark of every good, self-respectful, high-rolling, drinking drunk. A brand new pair of custom-made alligator shoes. I look just like a used car salesman. <laughs> or a dope dealer. And at 1030, I'm out my long roadmaster Buick honking the horn. And out comes my wife with the rollers in her hair. And she has on, it's that all your fault kimono that they just love to live in and dwell in and cry in. <laughs> to where she lost a string around the middle and it's pinned together with a big baby diaper pit. <laughs> and she's pulled all the threading and the fuzzing and the buttons off the front. And the front's just covered with tears and cigarette burns. It's what us drunks in Alcoholics Anonymous lovingly call the al designer house coat. <laughs> and I say that with a lot of love because I'll tell you, al is something extra special in this alcoholic's life. If I don't say it, I better say it now. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I have met lots of ladies in my life. But I have never met one as fine as Lois Wilson. And I knew Lois very, very well. I've been very, very fortunate. Very fortunate. I met Lois when I was five and a half months old. I was drugged Bill's 33rd birthday. I didn't have any money, nothing else. That's a story in itself. 
And so as a result of it, and so, and meanwhile, all the neighbors and had gathered out, you know. But before that, she come running out there and she, with a very kind, wifely, loving tone of voice, she screamed in the, like a banshee at me, said, what do you want, you sorry drunk? I said, let's go to the meeting. Meanwhile, all the neighbors had gathered out. And her side is lined up over here, and my side is lined up over here. And I can still hear the fine ladies of the neighborhood saying, isn't it a shame that such a beautiful and fine lady and the mother of two beautiful little boys married to such a sorry, no good, drunk like him? And my bunch over here hollering out, let her have it, David, let her have it. <laughs> and that used to be the weekend entertainment in every neighborhood we lived in. We moved 24 times before we come to Alcoholics Anonymous. Sometimes at midnight, high noon, daybreak, ahead of the sheriff, sometimes with the sheriff, sometimes behind, just kept moving. I said, let's go to the meeting. She said, doesn't get started for seven more hours, you no good drunk. And with that, she turned on her heels and went in the house. And that started seven tough hours. Here it was Sunday, and I'm sucking on the only bottle of juice that I had. And I knew I was going to have to have me a drink. But I knew that if I drank, I'd blow the deal. Because when I drank, I rolled it all the way. One of the biggest problems I had before I come down to Alex Anonymous, if they could find me, they'd pull me off my drunks, and I was not through drinking. And I'd come in, and I'd cry, and I'd pledge, and I'd promise, and I'd rededicate, and I'd paw my foot like a dog, and I'd wait till they took another check or some more money in my shirt pocket, and as soon as they turned their back, I'd run off to finish the drunk. Now, I was a stay away from home kind of drunk. Not on purpose. Or I'd get drunk, and I ended up in countries I never knew existed on this world. I ended up with people I never saw before in my life. Sometimes with money, sometimes without, sometimes with clothes on, sometimes the other way. They tell me one time I was gone 11 months. No one knew where I was. My mother, my father, my wife, my children. My patients, my enemies, my friends, no one knew where I was. And I come running in the house with the same clothes I guess I'd been in for about five months. And I asked my wife that brilliant question. Did anybody call? <laughs> and that does not make for good marriage relationships, I'll tell you. So I found just enough to nurse me along, keep the edge going. Finally at 4.30, honk the horn, here she came off wind. And we drove up this group. I walked in, looked like about 80 members of AA and their families and a poodle or two jumping up and down. It looked like to me and they were all hugging and kissing and rubbing up against and scratching and laughing and smoking cigarettes. And I looked at that bunch and I stepped back and I said, by gosh, if they're alcoholic and they're not drinking alcohol and they're having that much fun, then they have to be on dope. And then I looked up and saw all them signs, and I said, my God, I'm in a kindergarten. Then I saw but for the grace of God in my head up, because I knew at that time that I was not living according to the dictates of God's will for a human being. And I'm one of these that firmly believes that after an alcoholic gets to us and they get physically comfortable from the agent that forces us to come to a deep down inside Every one of us know this, even though many of us come to Alcoholics Anonymous without a full string of lights in our head. If there is a principle that we very seldom hear discussed in AA, if ever, we all fail to remember that every one of us were born human beings first. And when we're given the most precious gift that can ever be given to a human being, and it's God-given, whether you like it or we don't like it. And we begin to breathe in and out. Right there in the end is the creation and the formation and the growth of selfishness and self-centeredness. And from selfishness and self-centeredness stand all of those defects that we refuse to recognize as moral. Those defects that made our lives unmanageable, resentment, selfishness, dishonesty, and fear, and not wanting to tell another human being what's really churning on the inside of us. Afraid they're not going to like us. Afraid we're not going to love us. Afraid we're going to have to give up something we already have. Afraid we're not going to get something we want. 
and you pour alcohol into a human being like this human being that didn't like rest, didn't like discipline, was restless. I never was restless and irritable and discontented when I was drinking. I was drunk. It's in between drunks that I was restless, irritable, and discontented. And you pour alcohol into that, and something happens, you got one. You got one. And I did not know this. Because, you see, Alcoholics Anonymous does something that formalized, organized religion on a continuing basis has not, is not, will ever be able to do it. Medicine has not, is not, will ever be able to do it. Psychiatry has not, is not, will ever be able to do it. Human willpower has not, is not, will ever be able to do it. Government agencies has not, is not, will ever be able to do it. Treatment modalities has not, is not, will ever be able to do it. Acupuncture has not, is not, will ever be able to do it. Hypnosis has not, is not, will ever be able to do it. Horoscopes has not, is not, will ever be able to do it. Biorhythm charts has not, is not, will ever be able to do it. Witch doctors has not, is not, will ever be able to do it. Because Alcoholics Anonymous reaches down in the innermost depths of a human being, that most precious thing that comes with each and every one of us at birth. And after we get physically comfortable from the age of four, that fine, precious thing that says to us, thank you, little alcoholic, for not taking a drink of alcohol today. Thank you, little alcoholic, for finding a way to have a reasonably good night's sleep. But more important, thank you, little alcoholic, for finding a group of people who love you no matter what you have done, what you are doing, or what you ever will do. And the power of Alcoholics Anonymous lies, and when we get here, all we do through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and our 12 traditions, which are also spiritual principles, and also our 12 concepts of world service, which are also spiritual principles, all we do is to renew that contact that's given with each and every one of us at birth. You see, if we weren't born human beings first, Then, only alcoholics could have this program. But you see, uh-uh. Uh-uh. That's the reason why Al-Anon can have it. That's the reason why al can have it. It works on the inside of a human being. This thing in here. We can all look good on the outside. We can get our hair blowed out and the gals get the runners out of their panty drawers and all this stuff and get everything look real good. Walk around living dead on the inside. Hey, isn't that interesting how we look on the outside is how we feel and how we're living with our own selves within here, whatever it is, whatever it is. And so I did not know this. I certainly didn't. And then they, we went into the meeting and I sat on the back row and I wanted to look those people over see what kind of help I could afford to give them. And the first talker got up was a woman, the lioness, cheatingest person I'd ever been around in my life. And she stood up and said she was sober, sane, in her right mind, and had not had a drink of alcohol a year. And I jumped up and I screamed out, you are a liar. <laughs> and somebody said, shut up. <laughs> you know how a wet drunk answers you when you tell him, shut up, make me. They had enough in there to make me. And then that woman started talking. And she talked about her Jesus, and she talked about Christ, and about Jesus, and about Christ, and the twelve apostles. And I'm sitting there, and I said to myself at that time, what a heck of a trick to pull on a Jew, that they had invited him to a supposedly a meeting, and they're talking about Christ and Jesus, they got me there to convert me. And if this is what y'all were, I needed to drink real bad. Now, I'm asked all the time all over this world, really, David, how come there are not any more Jews and alcoholics and not what there is? Well, you see, it's very simple. You see, the way people have their noses fixed and their names changed, you don't know who you are sit next to in the AA meeting. <laughs> and it don't make a darn bit of difference. But my mind closed. I don't know why I did, why I got resentful. I ain't hit the church of the religion of my choice and the, uh, uh, my family in many, many years. But it gave me another reason not to listen. And I closed my mind, and that deal darn near killed me. 
And as soon as that meeting was over with and everybody went to the coffee and the cake, not me, I went out to my car. I got that half-fifth of whiskey out. Now, I don't know about anybody in here, but I drank that half-fifth down in two swallows. Now, that's where I drank alcohol. I didn't put it in a brandy glass and run around and sniff it for four hours and burn candles and incense and listen to Lawrence Welk. <laughs> and I didn't put an inch in the glass, 14 ice cubes, nine and a half inches of soda water and a straw and a fruit and a cherry and a half a Christmas tree on top of it and suck on it for about three hours. To me, that's sick drinking. I drank her to drop her down that hole where it'll do the most good and then put another one. Let me tell you what happened to me. I got that in me. My hair laid back down. My toes went back in those alligator shoes. I ran up the steps, got a hold of the oldest sober member in the group, got to arguing with him about the quality of y'all's fellowship. He said something to me, and I hit him. And when I was drinking, I was bad to hit folks. Taller than me, shorter than me, fatter than me, skinnier than me. And two of his AA babies joined in, and we started to fight. And as far as that... I was concerned that fight was a lot better than that AA meeting. And I was just whipping the dickens out of them two little sober drunks, and they did an unfair thing. They ran in two more drunks about the size of the outside linebackers on any professional football team. Now, you say the Cowboys don't say that no more. And finally, four of them picked me up bodily, two on each side, and threw me right out of that group. As I'm flying through the air, one of them said, We do not need your kind here. And another one said, and furthermore, you are too young to be an alcoholic. And that's exactly what I wanted to hear. And I stood on that grass that Sunday evening, drunk, with my fist clenched, screaming and hollering and cursing to anybody to live, listen to me, that I would never come back to this Christ soul saving organization as long as I live, that I was not an alcoholic, I was too young to be an alcoholic. But the next 17 years, everything that could possibly happen to a human being happened to this human being. And the only three things never did happen to me getting ready to get on a drunk, on a drunk, coming off a drunk right to this very second, is I never did willfully murder another human being, fall in love with another man, or die drunk. Other than that, it all happened. <laughs> Of course, I guess blackouts don't count. I really don't know. <laughs> and I'd married this wonderful gal, and when she got married, she didn't realize she'd married an alcoholic. We didn't start to build a marriage when we got married. We started to build a booby trap, one that could go off any week, month, or year. And I recall back in the service, gave me a chance to get way away from my creditors and that nagging wife and all them other things. And I recalled as a naval dental officer and went with a combat marine division, and I got into more trouble than there's trouble. Christmas Day, 54, I'm laying in a maximum security prison. It was under a code name that didn't have but 138 in there. And I didn't find out how I got there till after I got there. And the word was that when you arrived there, you never would leave. And I saw how some of them left with sheets from the top of their head down their toes. And here I am, I got a leg iron locked around my right leg, a chain welded to the leg iron, the other end of the chain welded to the steel cot, the foreleg of steel cot immersed in what little concrete, and there are armed gorillas around me 24 hours a day daring me to move. Now I'd been laying like that for seven and a half months. I was to lay like that for a solid year. And because of my insolence and because of my uncooperativeness and because of just being plain ugly, five of those seven and a half months I was on straight bread and water. And I'm hating society. And here it is, Christmas Day, 54. And in comes the orderly with the Christmas dinner. Now, I've been in lots of places where they don't give you knives and forks and spoons. And if they give you a spoon... Boy, they let you back in your iron little doggy house to count the spoons. But in this place, there was no such thing. You ate with your fingers, and the most you got was maybe two grains of rice in dishwater. You'd dream chicken in there. You know, hate and resentment can carry you a long way, but it'll work the mind. And in comes this little artery with the Christmas dinner, this mess. 
And he says, ho, 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 Merry Christmas. And I'm so full of Christmas joy and spirit and love for my fellow man, I said, ho, 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 you know what? He said, you sorry, no good. Now, you can call me anything in the world, but don't call me sorry. C.D. knows what I'm talking about. And he handed me that dinner, and he said, you're no good, you're rotten. And when he handed it to me, I picked it up, and I hit him right in the face with it. And my Christmas gift for doing it that Christmas day was 45 more straight days on bread and water. Now, that's what you call a bad day. I have not had a day that bad since I have been sober at Alcoholics Anonymous, and neither have you. I got out of that by lying, using my father's good name and all of his friends and by doing something else. And some people took their lives as a result of their involvement with me, and those were the first amends that I had to do. I didn't want to. My sponsor forced me to do it. first 45 days I was sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. I got out, I talked Grayson to taking me back. We decided to move, we moved to the little town of the Panhandle of West Texas, 30, about 3,500 folks, where they vote dry and drink wet. Two most popular people in, that's what they call a Christian environment. Two most popular people in the town is the bootlegger and the undertaker. And I'm drinking, I'm drinking every day, and I got up to where I weigh about 245 pounds, and my blood pressure is so high that every time my pulse would beat, my hair would stand straight up and pump like oil. <laughs> I had a fat doctor friend live close by. I went to go see him. He looked at me and said, My God, David, you look sick. He put the cuff around my arm, ran the air up. He said, David, it's a miracle you're alive. Your blood pressure is so high. He said, The reason your blood pressure is so high is because you're so fat. The reason you're so fat because you eat so much. No, that wasn't right. I was bloated. And he says, you don't have any guts and you don't have any willpower and I'm going to have to give you some help. And he wrote me a prescription for 60 of the most beautiful capsules I have ever seen in my life called Nemudons. And he says, take them as directed. Well, I went home. I got them wet, got them filled, went home to lose weight and stay drunk. Well, I looked at the pills and it says take one three times a day after you each meal. Well, who eats when you drink? And every good self-respectful drinking drunk knows if one's good, two's better, three's terrific. So I just took three of them, drank some whiskey, didn't feel like I was losing any weight. Come back out and took three more of them, drank some more whiskey, went to the bathroom, turned sideways in the mirror, didn't look like I was losing any weight. Come back out and took a handful of them, drank some more whiskey. Look like my stomach's getting bigger. You know, our co-founder Bill wrote some very prophetic lines when he says, when a drunk is drinking, it's time out of mind. And CD, the only sad thing I find about Alcoholics Anonymous is time passes so fast sober. Where does it go? And finally, I drank, took all the pills and drank all the whiskey. And the next thing I knew, I was in my backyard, and the best way I can describe it, a good old friend of mine out in California, he's dead now, old Jack, the, I like what he said. And the next thing I knew, I was out in my backyard and I was picking peaches off of rose bushes. I don't mind telling you. And they tell me I ran around that little town for two days talking in the unknown tongue. And being one of two Jewish families in five counties around, they gathered everybody in to see and hear the miracle. Because <laughs> word had spread like wildfire. The Jew had caught the Holy Ghost. <laughs> And when I come to and realize what happened, I says, my gosh, those pills are messing up my drinking. Oh, I'd been to the psychiatrist, and all the questions he asked me, Grace used to ask me for nothing, you know. <laughs> Finally had to leave that town, and you know, I used to terrorize that country. I'd, I'd, I'd drive, you know, and have that whiskey bottle with a paper sack. And you peel that sack down like a banana. And I'd drink with one hand and drive with the other all through that wild country out there. And I turn on my radio, and I love country western music more than anything in the world. And my favorite radio station in those days was Del Rio, Texas, where they sold Bibles and crosses and chains and rejuvenation powders and potions and lotions 
post office box. They sold everything in the world. You know, get your Cupid doll of Jesus. You can love him. You can hug him. You can kiss him. He's with you 365 days out of the year, and he glows in the dark. You know. <laughs> And they used to play the finest country western tunes. Don't wink those bloodshot eyes at me. And here's one that's good for 11 months of drinking and 14 months of crying. Only God made honky tonk angel. And I'd sit and I'd cry and I'd drive. We finally had to move away from that town, come back to Dallas with a wonderful opportunity. Wonderful. But it wasn't long before I'm down on that last skid row. Empty and wine, sleeping in them 55 cent night hotel rooms with your shoes tied around your neck. I went on once. The last nine, 11 months of drink. You see, the religion that my mother and father were born in, lived in, died and buried about 14 and a half years before I got sober. They lit the pan candles of the dead and said the prayers of the dead for seven consecutive days. And on the eighth day, they said the final prayer of death and blew out the flame of the candle. And as far as they were concerned, in their mind, I was dead. I was no longer alive on this earth. And that was the greatest thing in the world they could have done for them about me. That was total release. Total release. At that time, I had no parents. I couldn't work. Grace and the boys were total strangers. I went home. Grace looked at me and she said, Do you have to drink and do the things that you do? And I said, Grace, why don't you find another man that will marry you? You're such a fine lady that will be a good husband to you and a good father to those two fine little boys. I cannot function as a husband. I cannot function as a father. I cannot function in my profession. I have no desire to live anymore. But I can't get sober. And I grabbed my wine bottle and I proceeded to go out to try to kill myself. Somewhere along the line on April 19th or 20th of 67. I really don't know when. I found the handwriting on the floor of the county jail in Dallas, Texas. Now, I've been in lots of jails, and incidentally, being in jail is not a requirement for membership in Alcoholics Anonymous. By this time, I got to the point in my life where I couldn't stay sober, and I couldn't stay drunk, and I couldn't kill myself, and I couldn't stay alive. Folks, that is the real dual problem for an alcoholic. All this other garbage we hear, I'm an alcoholic, and this, and that. Let me tell you what the real one is. When you can't stay sober and you can't stay drunk and you can't kill yourself and you can't stay alive. The human spirit is almost snuffed. And I laid on that jail floor and my whole life that I've been telling you about was passing through from the time I was born. I'm almost 47 years old. Everything near and dear that I thought that I needed was gone. But I found out something in the next few seconds. What I really needed. And with no conditions whatsoever, I did not say, please. I said, God, help me. And I know that there's not only a God for me then, there is right this very second because I am still here and I have not had a drink of alcohol. The minute I ask for God's help with no condition whatsoever, getting me out of my way, deep down inside were these words, Continue sobriety, Alcoholics Anonymous. Continue sobriety, Alcoholics Anonymous. Continue. We never know when that needle will hit bottom when we make off. That's the reason the 12 steps that we tried to carry this message. But we do it for our sobriety. 
And I said, if I ever get out of here, I'm going to find those people in Alcoholics Anonymous. And how I got by that old sheriff, I do not know because of the next to the last time that I was in his jail. As I was being released, I was brought before him. He looked at me and he said, boy, if you show up in my jail again for drinking the drunk and the things that you do, I will have you put away to where you will never bother another human being, bird, tree, dog, or rock. Do you understand? I said, yes, sir, Mr. Bill. And I walked right out of his jail, went right to the whiskey store, got me another bottle of muscadoodle, and got out there in the park with the rest of them winos and pigeons and said, I beat him again. And how I got by him, I don't know this time. I start looking for the people in Alcoholics Anonymous. I found out that Edith, the gal who asked me to come to her first birthday, she had passed away, but she was continuously sober when she passed away. Her sponsor, Moena, had moved to West Texas. After I was sober nine months, Moena moved back. She became the secretary of our group. She later went back to manicuring. I used to see Moena every Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock as my manicure. And in March of 1986, Moena passed away. And if she would have lived two more months, she would have been 39 continuous years sober at Alcoholics Anonymous. The only one that I knew that it was at that meeting was a man. He was sober eight years. He drank eight years. In this stretch, he's sober 24 continuous years. This may will be 25, 26. I called him up. I said, W.O., are you still interested in Alcoholics Anonymous? He said, who is it for? I said, it is for me. He said, well, we have a meeting tomorrow night. Let's just go and get it over with. And don't you take a drink of alcohol today and call me tomorrow morning at 7.30, boom, and he hung up. That's all he said. Now, he is my sponsor. He has been from the word go. He hasn't drunk nor has he died. And everything he's told me has been the truth. And he hung up because, you see, after 37 and a half years of drinking, it was cold turkey. Well, it's more like frozen buzzard. <laughs> I started walking and shaking out a drunk. 7.30 the next morning, I called him. He says, are you drinking? I said, no, sir. Don't you take a drink of alcohol today. <laughs> and called me 3.30 this afternoon. Boom! And he hung up. And thank God I walked and shook that drunk out. And when I come to, I didn't have a belly full of tranquilizers, nor did I have a prescription for 500 more. And after he hung up at 7.30 that morning, started that walking and that shaking and that crawling and that sweating and that jumping. And finally at 3.30 I called him again. He said, are you drinking alcohol? I said, no, sir. He said, do you really want to come to an AA meeting? I said, more than anything else in this world, please. And he said, you want me to come pick you up? Being about as humble as Saddam Hussein. <laughs> I said, I'll get there under my own steam. And he told me where it was. And boom, he hung up. Well, I was in a terrible predicament. All the clothes I had was no pair of, that I had on. It was an old pair of thermal underwear. An old gray sweater with the elbows out of the elbows. An old pair of gray flannel pants with all of my possessions in them. No socks, but I still hadn't quite lost everything yet. I had a pair of beat-up old alligator shoes. And the only money I had was 30 cents, and that was all left in the last blood I sold the blood bank to buy white. Now, when one comes to A in that shape, one is not doing very well. <laughs> and I couldn't go to A. After all, I'm a professional man. I couldn't go to A looking like a bum. And I'd heard that Grace had thrown out all my clothes. So I took a chance and I called her up. And she didn't recognize my voice. She said, who is this? I said, me. She says, what does me want? I says, Grace, do you happen to have one of my old suits? She says, yes, I have one. And it is to bury you in. That's even before she come to Al not. <laughs> I then asked that woman the most foolish question I have ever asked her in my life. I said, do you mind if I borrow it for a little while? 
<laughs> I'm going to an AA meeting. She said, it's another one of your lies and hung up. That suits her story itself. They allowed me to come in her house. Now, there wasn't instant joy in that family when I come in and told them I'm going to AA. Uh-uh. Everything I walked by, looked at, inhaled, breathed on, she run behind me and sprayed. And I put that old suit on. I bet she and the young and goodbye got into a Mustang that the bank was looking to repossess it, but they couldn't recognize it. it. looked like an accordion. And off I went to the meeting. And I walked in, looked like the same people that were there 17 years earlier. One of them old-timers come up to me, looked down at me, and he grinned from ear to ear, and he said, We knew you'd be back. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you about the greatest day talk I've ever heard in my life. And hey, we don't have any speakers. Ah, we're just a bunch of talkers. Ours is the language of the heart. And thank God it is not the language of the gutter. I've been privileged to hear from Bill on. This is the greatest AA talk I've ever heard in my life. And if your group hadn't told it to you, you have been cheated. This man then said to me, welcome, come in and sit down and have a cup of coffee and let's talk about it. We understand exactly how you feel. He did not say to me, you never should have done those things. He didn't say to me, if you really loved me, you wouldn't have done those things. He just simply said, welcome, come in and sit down and have a cup of coffee and let's talk about it. We understand exactly how you feel. That was the first time in the last 17 years of my drinking anyone shook my hand. It was the first time in the last 17 years of my drinking anyone welcomed me in. It was the first time in the last 17 years of my drinking that anyone asked me to sit down and share a cup of coffee with them. And it was the first time in the last 17 years of my drinking anyone said to me, we understand exactly how you feel. And when the meeting started, it was the first time in the last 17 years of my drinking that anyone allowed me to come and sit with them, as dirty and as smelly as I was. And I'm still shaking and I'm still jumping and the drunks are on either side of me and they're putting their hands on my knees and my elbows and their shoulders and they're saying, easy does it, first things first, this too will pass. And when they passed the basket, I didn't have any money. And no one called me a tightwad. No one called me a deadbeat. And then when they stood to pray, and I did not know the Lord's Prayer. And no one called me a dummy. And no one called me an idiot. And no one called me an agnostic. And no one called me an atheist. And when that was over with, it was the first time in the last 17 years of my drinking that people came up to me and they hugged me and they kissed me and they told me they loved me for what I had become, where I had been, and what I was right there and then. And when I got ready to leave, that night, those fine people said to me, David, please come back. We need you, and you need us, folks. That is Alcoholics Anonymous. Nothing more. Nothing less. Just God's grace working through the sober, recovering members of Alcoholics Anonymous. Hugging and loving. An alcoholic who thought life was over with. That had no desire that he was helpless and hopeless and useless. That is Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, we can be beautiful and quote the steps and quote the traditions and quote the promises, but baby, if it ain't living in here, I'll tell you right now, it just ain't there. The potential is there. The potential. I believe our 12 steps sums it all, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, not the previous 11 or those, but these. And why is it these? Because the fulfillment of the spiritual awakening comes about. We try to carry this message to alcoholics. And we carry the message of our recovery, our way of life, by practicing these principles in all our affairs. It's a total package. I had trouble practicing these principles in all of my affairs when I first got to AA, and I went to my sponsor, and I told him, I'm having trouble practicing these principles in all my affairs, and he said, David, you will always have trouble practicing these principles in all your affairs until you cut out some of your affairs. 
<laughs> and when I cut them out, made the practice of the principles a lot more simple. When I got to you people, little I realized my wife and two sons, we'd ever be under one roof again because that marriage had been written off by everything and everybody and it had no right to be. But only because of God's grace through the miracle of Alcoholics and my life and only because of God's grace through the miracle of al and Grace's life, that beautiful and wonderful lady this past June the 10th, which is also AA's birthday, Grace and I celebrated 47 years and that's pretty good for a drunk. Although I was not there for many, many years. I wasn't there for many years. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you because I'm in AA and Grace is in al that our marriage is absolutely 100% perfect and beautiful. <laughs> that the butterflies are tranquil. That the bluebirds are hugging and kissing and cooing. Heck no. We have a few short rounds every now and then. We have a few long rounds every now and then. That's what you call clearing the air, communicating. And the best way I can describe our marriage today, it's built on solid, constructive imperfections. <laughs> because it's by our imperfections that we grow. And anyway, she goes to five, six, I'll not meet a week, and I go sometimes six, seven, eight, a meets a week. And we don't see each other enough to have all that nitpicking, arguing, and fighting, and fussing. You know, our co-founder Bill, many years ago, addressing our brothers and Canadian brothers and sisters, and also us, us from the United States. And he says, you know, the greatest thing that's happened in the world was the creation and the formation of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the second greatest thing that's happened in the world after that was the creation and formation of Al-Anon. And Bill's words is the, because Al-Anon fills that vast void of broken relationship between blood, kin, and emotionally attached and folks, whether we like it or not, that is the most distorted area. Our two sons are grown today. Old one who is 15 years of age. Put a butcher knife in my breastbone. He's going to kill me for what I was doing to their mother. And if I could have gotten up, I'd have beat that boy to death. Then the wildness left his eyes. He dropped that knife and he spat in my face and he says, You're no longer my father and I'm no longer your son. And he walked out of my life. And that hurts, and I had no communication with a number of years. You see, they love their mother more than anything else in the world. Because their mother was their mother, their mother was their father, their mother was their Santa Claus, their mother took them on picnics and took them to the Little League. I wanted to, I wanted to more than anything in the world, but I drank and I disappeared. And their mother was the only link to their sanity. And they were willing to kill me to preserve that link for their sanity. And oh how I resented it till after I got sober and looked at me. And they were absolutely would have been justified. Today we not only have a tremendous relationship with son one and son two, but more important, we're the best of friends. When I got sober, I had to go to the regulatory agency to license my profession to practice. I had to go tell them the truth. Or what I did. Not make promises, promise to kill drunks. They kept me down there for about a week. And they said, we won't let you go back to work. Because I never abused my DEA number or anything like that. I just get drunk and leave. And I've been there ever since. Now I'm asked all over this world, and y'all heard just the nicer parts of my story. You've been locked up. You've been gone. How did you ever get through school? Well, I was my class valedictorian in a high school. I finished second of a class of 450 at Southern Methodist University, and I'm a graduate of Baylor University College of Dentistry. And he said, how'd you do it? Real simple. You cheat. <laughs> it doesn't take our kind long to find another human being who will do for us what we cannot possibly do for ourselves. <laughs> And see what I've been telling you, this is all Alcoholics Anonymous. Not me, because ours is not a personal success story, but one of colossal human failure, converted into great strength by the alchemy of the living grace of God, as he expressed in the recovery program of Alcoholics Anonymous, my fellowship they're in. So you see, only because of God's grace through the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have a sober life today. 
And only because of God's grace through the miracle of the recovery program of Alcoholics Anonymous, have a God today, a God that I found through the big book and the 12 steps and through you people and from nowhere else. And only because of God's grace through the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have a family that loves and respects me. I have a roof over my head. I have the best way to make a living I have ever had in my life. I have hundreds of thousands of friends and Alcoholics Anonymous, Al Not Al Teen, the world in which we all live in. I have some reasonably nice clothes today. I have two cars with gasoline in them, I hope. I have a few <laughs> dollars in my pocket and a few dollars in the bank, not many. I have meat in the refrigerator and groceries in the pantry. And I'll tell you a little secret. If you want anything any more than that, you either oversexed or plumb nuts. <laughs> Y'all bits of kind and I want to leave you with something. Framed in our archives in our general service office is a letter that was written to our co-founder Bill on December 30th, 1946. It was written to Bill by a non-alcoholic thanking him for a wartime printing of the book of Alcoholics Anonymous when due to the paper shortage they had to cut the size of the book down but never left the intake out. It was written to Bill by a non-alcoholic whose family name is perhaps the most famous family name that the world has ever known in regards to banking, energy, financing, grants, real estate, endowments. A non-alcoholic who loved AA more than life itself. And there are a few of us in AA who really believe, and we know, that it hadn't been for that non-alcoholic and his non-alcoholic associates, that our big book never would have been written, that Bill and Bob never would have gone on. They made sure that Bill had as much money as Bob, and vice versa, so that they wouldn't leave and carry the primary purpose of the message and work with drunk. And this letter was written to Bill by John D. Rockefeller, Jr., the first part of the letter is thanking Bill for the book and for the inscription on the flyleaf, but this is the part of the letter I want to leave with it to Bill, quote, It must be of great satisfaction for you to realize that the helping hand that you extended to a needy brother many years ago has resulted in the widespread extension of that brotherly act. The regenerating power of the spirit of that helping hand has been the means by which countless lives have been saved that otherwise would have been wrecked. May God continue to bless you and use you ever increasingly as his chosen instrument in the rebuilding of broken lives. Every one of us here in this meeting right this very second, we're here as the only the result of the extension of that friendly hand from Bill to Dr. Bob to Bill D. And here we are now. The regenerating power of the Spirit from the inside outward. We're here as a result of that because somebody cared, somebody loved, somebody wanted, somebody needed. If there is a hope, if there is a prayer, if there is a desire that I have for each and every one of us, may we continue to let God bless us and use us ever increasingly as his chosen instrument in the rebuilding of broken lives. And how will God continue to do this? And that is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. God bless each and every one. Thank you and I love you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.